Yeah, I kind of really know what the plan was. The plan was just to like lose weight. Because if I could just get to whatever number it was, life would somehow magically get better. It just kept getting worse. It felt better because I felt safer because I was smaller, which for some reason matters. Anorexia, and it's just, for whatever reason in my head, it was stronger that way. And being strong was important because I don't want to get my ass kicked at home, emotionally or physically. So, you know, the motto is kids should be seen and not heard. And I'm literally trying to fucking disappear in front of your eyes and you're not even looking. The clinical director, intake person, I don't know, called me back like immediately and he wants to do an intake. I said, I don't know. Uh, but I agreed. And he's like, I need to see you tomorrow. I need you to be here tomorrow. I was like, that's not happening. I'm not coming tomorrow. And he's like, you're going to die. And I was like, I don't care. Eating disorders thrive in secrecy. I mean, if nobody steps in, the shit doesn't get better. What is your name? My name is Dana. The big question is, what is an eating disorder? For me, an eating disorder is personal hell. It's really about having terrible pain and restricting food so that I can feel better. And like a bigger picture, it's about people wanting to feel better and using food in a variety of ways to try to feel better. So those restriction, binge purge, compulsive exercise, and sometimes substance abuse to help with um, management of weight. So it's a mental illness, but it's expressed in physical signs. And people sometimes miss the suffering because they're looking at the weight. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into it and share your story however you feel like you want to. This is probably going to be lots of tears. It has been a really long time since I've told this story and a really long time since I've been like so in touch with how much it hurts. So growing up was hard. I grew up in a family with a lot of domestic violence, throwing anything and everything, choking mom, mom not leaving, and really being just fucking stuck in hell. Um, dinners would be my dad getting pissed off and trying to stab my head with a fork, throwing knives into walls. Interesting, it comes out in food, right? Like, you get a eating disorder, but your dad's crazy at dinner time. First time that I really, really knew like my particular body was a problem was fifth grade, for sure. Like light bulb memory. I was in gymnastics and I loved it. And I was in the, I was out of the house. I would have to be with my fucking crazy parents. And I was there a lot. And I'd been into gymnastics since I was like two. So by fifth grade, long important relationships with coaches that I just wanted to fucking please yeah the head coach pulled my mom aside after class right in front of me and was like hey you know she she'd perform a lot better if she lost weight I don't even really know why it mattered because it wasn't a competitive gymnastics place it was a rec place however in domestic violence house that I grew up in you do whatever you have to to make everything look okay so people don't get suspicious. My mom and dad decided that I was going to go on a diet, that I was going to lose weight. I did. Got a lot of praise at the gym for losing weight, performing better. It was great because the coaches like loved on me for losing weight. So even from that, I started looking at other people's bodies, girls' bodies, and like bigger, smaller, like. I don't know. It, it mattered. And for reasons like I didn't even know then. I'm almost 48. So back in that day, eating disorders were something that people knew too much about. Grew up in the 90s. So like heroin chic was a thing, 80s and 90s. I don't have that body type. Never had it. Never got to have it. Tried really hard to get it. Almost died trying to get it more than once. Fast forward to eighth grade, and I just lost my fucking mind. You know, dating, guys liking you, and oh my gosh, you know, trying to get out of the house more. I liked the guy. I don't remember if he liked me back, I think not. And I think there is one of the reasons that I just was like, okay, it's my weight, because what else could it be? 
So I very clearly remember deciding that I was going to use whatever I had to to drop weight. I was probably like, I don't know, 150 pounds or so. Not a big deal. I was really athletic. I was doing gymnastics and karate and softball, and I was constantly on the move. I cut down meals from three meals to two meals to wet meal to like an apple and toast or something like that every other day. At the same time, I was using like 20 fiber pills a day and started back in the day. There was something called, called I don't know if that's still on the market. Kind of like speed, lost your appetite, made you kind of crazy. But that was fine. It was in my head, like well worth it. That's all I cared about. And the crazy thing about it now is I'm so fucking mad that nobody said anything. What I got was from a teacher. She pulled me aside and she's like, hey, I noticed you lost a lot of weight. Um, parents would make up excuses like, oh, she just forgets to eat. So fast forward to high school, I was high performing, I was high achieving, but nobody knew what I was doing to keep performing and to keep losing weight. weight. And I think what suffered most was probably friendships. Anytime folks wanted to go out to eat, not only would I not eat, I'd sit there and just shake because I was so afraid to eat the food because anything there was catastrophic. If I gained any weight, it was going to be terrible. And I would kind of wait check with my mom and go like, hey, I look like I gained weight. And she'd be like, yeah, you should probably take this five pounds off. Started working out a lot in high school. I was 16. I was going to the gym at least once or twice a day on top of going to whatever it is, eight hours of school, doing homework and performing in a variety of music situations. I got in the middle of a fight with my parents. They were yelling at each other. And I told, walked upstairs and got in the middle, told my dad, whatever I said, it was sarcastic because that's kind of my MO at that time. And I, he slapped me so hard, I spun around in a circle. And I got in his face and I told him, if you ever fucking touch me again, I'm going to kill you. And I probably would have. And I probably would have been okay with it. You know, and uh, he never did anything again. At least physically. It's like he would chase us around the house. We were on the house. I'd lock myself in the bathroom. And he'd kick on the doors and make the doors jump. I was drinking. I was smoking weed at the time too. Because what the fuck? Who wouldn't? Finally got out of high school. Went on to college. Got a couple years under my belt in college. Of course, did really well. High achieving. Didn't bother anybody. Had friends. Nobody knew anything. Except like I wasn't really eating. And anytime somebody would say something to me, I just get fucking angry. And I had such a huge anger that people would back off and they wouldn't approach. But everybody knew because people would just kind of be like, oh, hey, you want this? You want that? I'm like, I'm good. I ate this morning. And the compulsive exercise got really intense. But it didn't matter if I ran 14 miles in the morning, if I felt unsafe or uncomfortable because I ate too much, I'd run 14 more at night. Got stuck out on long runs. People would offer to pick me up on the side of the road. I'm like, no, I'm fine. I decided my junior year to go study abroad. I was engaged at the time. The guy was great. His family was great. I got to Spain. Again, still nobody knew what I was doing. I mean, they couldn't miss it, but they also nobody said anything. It was hard. I was afraid all the time. I was in a country. I spoke Spanish, but I mean, obviously not with their accent and it was, it was hard to be there. I ended up restricting to the point where I was um, under a hundred pounds. I was in my early twenties, even in eighth grade, I wasn't under a hundred pounds. So I just couldn't stop moving and stop exercising. I went to the director of the program who was the liaison for school. I'm afraid. Because my heart would beat at night. I'd be laying down. It would go beat, 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 long pause. And then it would slam so hard that I'd like jolt out of bed. And I was starting to get scared. And that was probably the first time I'd ever been like scared. It was enough to say something. And I did. And he told me, um, yeah, you just want to go home. And I was like, yeah, I do want to go home. <laughs> like, that was by like a confession, deepest, darkest secret. And I just got, yeah, you want to go home? So I went home. Uh, my fiance, my parents being hit by the airport. And my dad walked past me three times and didn't even recognize me. Went home, 
and uh, to that to my parents' house. But God yelled and screamed that I was standing by the oven trying to get warm and instead of trying to get warm and stay warm. You're not that cold. How could you be that cold? Like literally sitting on chairs, couches, everything hurt because just bones. So it was painful. My parents sent me back. They sent me back to Spain. I told the director, I got to go back. And he told me, the only way you're going back is if you would draw, and if you would draw, then you would draw from the university also. And like literally, I'm dying. My hair is falling out. I have like thicker hair in my arms because my body's trying to stay warm. Petition the dean was allowed to come home. I was, I'm going to say, forced to go to therapy, which was kind of a blessing. And I kind of wanted to be forced. And I was also really pissed off too. So I did my intake. I told, the therapist, I'm like, I'm not going because I don't want to be the fattest person in the room. And I was still really underweight, but you can't see that. I couldn't see anything. Like, I look at pictures. I'm like, I would never fucking let a friend suffer like that. Um, we had an eating disorder group at school, and one of the therapists was older woman. She also had an eating disorder, so she's not active anymore, but she's in full recovery, living a great life. Yeah. Um, Staying with her, staying in group, really active in my eating disorder still. Um, decided to go on to graduate school. I was still out of my mind. But I performed well, so people missed it. Or didn't pay attention, or it wasn't that bad, because I could still perform. Got done with graduate school. Did my internship. Did great. Went on to my postdoc. This was a problem. This is where everything got worse, if it's possible. I decided that it would be a really good idea to start working out three times a day. So before work, during lunch, and after work, it seemed to make sense. It was like the only thing that made sense. And I was like, okay, I'll do this. So I was working at a counseling center and the woman who was my supervisor, she's the person who ran the eating disorder program and was my supervisor. So one day she decided that she would talk to me about it. Basically, at the end of the conversation, I left and I went into my office and I started calling programs. She didn't tell me I had to, but she made it really uncomfortable for me to stay too. Called a program, the clinical director, intake person, I don't know, called me back like, immediately and he wants to do an intake I said, I don't know. uh but i agreed i was like well why the fuck not so he did it and he's like i need to see you tomorrow i need you to be here tomorrow i was like that's not happening i'm not coming tomorrow and he's like you're gonna die and i was like i don't care and he he's like i don't think that you really get this you're going to die and you don't really have that much longer left. Which is really hard to hear coming from somebody who's like a therapist when a medical doctor tells you you're pretty much fine. And I called my mom and I told her, hey, I'm, I'm going to get a treatment. I need somewhere to stay. So I called the guy back. I'm like, look, I can't be there tomorrow. I'll come Friday. It was a Wednesday. I remember it really clearly. So pack my shit up. Showed up. Of course, worried about being like the best person in the room because now I'm in ED treatment with people who do what I do. Somebody else came in with me the same day. I just felt like, oh my fucking God, what are we doing? And I happened to admit on the night where they did a meal outing. We went to Cheesecake Factory. And I'm like, are you fucking crazy bitches going to make me eat this food? Like my first day. And I was like, can't do this. The person who admitted with me, we do a lot of crazy shit. She literally threw her food and ran to the bathroom, which let the rest of us toss our food. Because there's only so many therapists and there was a lot of us. I was like, I don't think I can do this. They kept showing up. It was a partial hospitalization program. So I was there eight to 10 to 12 hours a day, uh, Monday to Friday and half the day on Saturday. 
I was really, really lucky to be admitted to a program where all the therapists, except for one, were recovered. I, I never seen anybody who had the eating disorder, let alone recovered from eating, eating disorder, and didn't look like what I thought people would look like, like huge, like 600 pounds. They were perfect, all of them. And they all looked different, and they were great. So critical moment in treatment was my therapist came and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I just don't feel like I have a soul. There's, there's literally nothing there. She let me stay in the room for like days. I'd be gone. I'd go home, I'd come back and I'd get back to the room. And She'd come check in, have to do the programming, have to eat the fucking meals, have to do your stupid insurers if you didn't finish your meals, all that shit. But otherwise, she just let me be. So one day, she came in, and she said, okay, Kina, how are you? And I was just, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. And I got to work. I didn't want to get better. I didn't want to gain weight. Couldn't get better without gaining weight. So I did. And I needed it. I don't even know what happened, but I got better. My graduation from graduate school was being held. And I was like, hey, my graduation's happening. And they're like, hey, we're going to have to talk about whether you can go. I was like, what? And they're like, we're really worried. I'm like, I worked my whole fucking life for this. I'm going to my graduation. So, you know, big meeting, all the people, and they gave me permission. It was so hard to go back to graduation because it had been some time between the time my cohort last saw me when I was pretty sick and the time where I'd been in early recovery and I didn't want people to see me. It was terrible and great at the same time. Like, I went because I worked hard. But feeling like I was so ashamed to have people see that I'd gained weight it was rough. But I'm glad I went. I went back to treatment. Happened to turn 30 in treatment, which requires, you know, a fucking birthday cake that everybody has to eat. I'm like, I'm really sorry, you guys. I didn't plan for that. Can we just not? How to make a decision during treatment if I was going to go back to my postdoc and finish that out. And I decided I didn't want to. I did pretty okay when I came back from treatment the first time. And yes, there's more than one time. Cleaned out all my clothes, my closets, while I still felt really strong, knowing that most of the clothes in there weren't going to fit anymore. I'm glad I did it early. I finished out my postdoc hours and decided that'd be a great idea to start throwing up. Uh, Really not my thing. I, I wasn't good at it. It hurt. It wasn't fun. Got the job done. And I got caught by the director. So off to treatment again, hated the program and decided I'll meet your stupid criteria and let me get the hell out of here. That was a long time ago. I never, never got as active in my eating disorder again as I was when I was really sick and in early recovery. I am definitely at this point, I'm not 100% recovered and I don't think it's in my cards. Folks do, but it's my eating disorder started really early, and there was a lots of years where I didn't get care. Um, and it wasn't, even when I did, it's not what happens today. Uh, so that's not in my cards, and I'm, I'm not at peace with it, but I'm also aware that that doesn't mean I'm, I have a terrible life. It means for sure... I have to be I can't hide I can't hide for myself can't hide for my partner can't hide for my therapist even though I hate both of them sometimes because I can't hide so between the time I got out of my second treatment and today things change slowly I'm almost 48. So I met my partner later in life, certainly after these treatments. 
for the first time, I wasn't eating alone. I did my recovery pretty much alone outside of treatment. Didn't have a partner, didn't have friends with eating disorders, didn't have family that gave a fuck or really, I mean, they cared conveniently, but when it push came to shove, they weren't really in it. Um, my recovery, depending on how I feel, there's some days where I'm straddling the fence. Like, oh, I could use the behavior and I'll feel better temporarily. Sometimes I get to the temporarily. Sometimes my brain just doesn't go there. I'm like, oh, yes, this is a great idea. Um, let's not eat. Let's skip this meal. Let's go on an extra long walk, run. Let's do an extra row. And I'm kind of like, I have to pause. And there is an intense fight that goes on in my head. I'm like, you know what? I don't have another fight for my life in me. And if I decide to commit to an eating disorder, I'm done because I don't have that fight again. I'm worn out. Today, I have a partner who will sit and eat with me. And honest to God, he's been to the dietitian with me, seeing the same one for like 20 fucking years. I hate her. And I love her. And I hate her too because she's, you know, that person. He will say, hey, that doesn't look like a full meal. And it is so much easier to just eat my fucking food than argue with him. And the dietitian loves that. My doctor loves that. The therapist loves that. I love that. I don't know if it comes across in those moments because I'm usually pretty pissed off, but I do love that. It's a lot easier to recover, not in isolation. So today, more times than not, I will not straddle the fence. I'll live my life according to my values and what I want and how I want it. And sometimes I can't. Sometimes it's too much. So my life now is something I didn't think I'd make it past 21. And I don't feel like I'm living on borrowed time anymore. And I know that I'm in charge. And I know my eating disorder is like part of me, but all it gets to do is yell at me. It does not get to tell me what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it and promise me that I'm going to have the life I want if I just listen to it. Because I know it's a big fucking lie now. And I'm not going to listen because I don't want that life. I think that's the story. That's the story of recovery. What would be your biggest tip for somebody out there suffering with ED? They're good at keeping a secret and their support system is very good at not acknowledging the secret. This is what I tell folks who come to see me. You only need 10 seconds of intense bravery to tell somebody that you're suffering. Your life doesn't have to revolve around food and body weight and just takes 10 really intense seconds to tell somebody that you need help or that you're hurting and you're worth it even up with all the voices telling you that you're not. The big thing, eating disorders live in secrecy and you don't have to keep it a secret. Because pe people will care about you even when all the voices tell you they don't or they're not going to. It might not be your people that you were born into, but your chosen people. And they matter too, even more. What is recovery? Oh, so many things. Recovery for me is I have to live my life sometimes doing exactly opposite of what my head tells me to do. And when I do that, my life gets really, really big. It opens up. I have friends. I have people I can trust. I have a great partner who's around all the time, even when I'm acting terrible. Uh. It's about getting to choose. I can choose to use behaviors. I damn well know that I'm choosing them. But I have a choice that I never had before. So if I can choose what I'm going to do, 
that for me is recovery. And I choose more times than not to do what I need to do, but having a choice for me is the bottom line. That's it. Woo! I don't know if you're going to be able to understand any of that. Do you think it'll come out? I really hope it will. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kenny Hill with Recovery Hill. My intention here is to show the diversity of sobriety. How one finds themselves clawing from bottom is as nuanced as their journey to bottom. And their situation and recovery has the potential to be highly relatable to somebody who is watching. Therefore, I offer the interviewees to have total freedom to express whatever has worked for them whatever has helped them sustain sobriety. That said, here at the end of the interview, I wanna make a quick request so that it wasn't to take away from the interview itself. This request is that you like and share the video. You can subscribe if you want, that's up to you, but at least like and share it so that the content can get to as many people as possible. There is a great capacity and potential for the story you just watched to be able to help out somebody else to begin their story of recovery.